Programming Throwdown, Episode 73, Parallel Computing with Incredibill. Take it away, Jason. Hey, everyone. So, um, chances are you're, you're listening to this after the giveaway. Um, we're recording this before the giveaway, just before the giveaway. But hopefully, uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber, you got one of our really cool, uh, um, you know, laser cut, laser cut acrylic little stencils. Uh, that's a guarantee. And uh, hopefully, if you're out there, you got something else cool too in the raffle. Um, but today we have a really cool episode. Um, we're going to talk to Dory Exterman, who's the CTO of Incredibuild. And we're going to talk all about kind of parallel computing. Um, at Incredibuild, they've built this really cool system for, um, kind of combining uh, I'll let him kind of explain it in more detail, but but combining parallel computing and, and allowing you to use kind of the machines you have right now sitting around your office in like a distributed uh, fashion. Um, so, Dory, why don't you tell us kind of your background, what got you into parallel computing and, and sort of a bit of history? Uh, so my background, it's uh, uh, I think I have more than uh, 25 years of experience in software development. I, uh, const- I, I did a lot of development in, in uh, the areas of uh, uh, information and later on in uh, low level as well. Uh, and uh, after that, for, for a couple of years, I consulted many companies uh, in uh, different uh, areas of technologies, advanced technologies, uh, uh, client server, uh, multi-tenant, etc., uh, which led me quite naturally to uh, parallel computing and efficiency and optimization areas. As, and uh, seven years ago, I joined Incredible to lead the technical side of the company. And since then, I'm uh, here. And that's uh, one of the coolest companies I ever worked in. And uh, I'm really, right. I, I think I'm going to be here for a while. So, yeah. Cool. <laughs> You've been there seven years, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, pretty so. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Was it? Uh, did you start the company or uh, had it well, already The company started? is very mature. It's. Uh, I think we are more than 15 years in the market already. Uh, since uh, from the era in which uh, parallel computing wasn't that popular, you only had one core on each uh, PC, uh, mm-hmm. and then uh, you know it, things went very slowly. So. Uh, in these eras, uh, when you needed more horsepower, you didn't have an, any way actually to achieve it. You couldn't buy, purchase a machine with multiple cores unless you had a lot of money. Uh, and uh, the idea behind the company came actually from SETI at Home, which is uh, a NASA project from the beginning that uh, tried to find uh, extraterrestrial lives uh, using distributed computing. So in the 80s, you were able to install some software on your computer and then NASA would uh, distribute these uh, uh, audio files they recorded, and your computer was able to uh, analyze this audio file and see if there are signs for extraterrestrial lives. And the I remember that. Did, yeah. Yeah, I remember having the SETI at home screensaver. Exactly. And so basically, when your computer went idle, uh, you know, instead of having a bouncing ball or something like that, um, you would just yeah, you would be scanning for aliens. And it's still it's still a, a live project, I think. They are still doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in, the, in this era, when you had a, just very limited uh, resources, so NASA really needed your home computers in order to scale this. And the founders of the Incredible thought, well, if NASA is doing it for extraterrestrial uh, life uh, finding, why can't we do that for other stuff as well? And they started in accelerating uh, Visual Studio builds. Uh, so this was 15 years ago when you only had one core. Uh, and uh, when I joined the company, we already had multiple cores. So uh, the, we thought that once uh, people will have uh, 16 cores or even four cores, the problem will go away. But in fact, what we are always finding is that uh, in the same ratio as the amount of cores are raising in your local machine, the problem goes, uh, grows bigger as well. So people are always <laughs> always need more resources, which makes us still relevant uh, and even more relevant than we were in the past. Cool, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you kind of touched on it, but yeah, it sounds like yeah, the big motivation behind parallel computing is that you have sort of some very expensive process, but uh, it can be broken up into pieces and then solved in parallel. Yeah. Um, uh, 
what what are uh you know, what are you know, most of your customers what what are they you know trying to solve i mean not you know i'm sure there's there's you know uh confidential things and things like that but in general like what's the uh sort of areas that that your company can help has has so helped with yeah essentially we are focused we we've started with accelerating visual studio so uh we have, we we are focused there as uh, even today uh, so uh, many of our customers, I wouldn't say all, but many of our customers are, are uh, Visual Studio users and are accelerating either their uh, Visual Studio compilations or any kind of computation that they have as part of their uh, continuous integration uh, systems. Uh, but essentially, uh, I think it was uh, six, five years ago, we opened the technology. Uh, we, we wrote it from the beginning to be generic. Uh, and we opened the technology to be, uh, to, for users to be able to uh, use it for any kind of, uh, compute intense execution. So today users are using it for, uh, compilation, for testing, packaging, uh, artificial intelligence training, weather forecasting, financial derivatives. Uh, we are highly popular in the gaming industry. In the gaming industry, I think we are used by something like the, the largest 1000 studios in the world. Doing Xbox, Sony, uh, Nvidia Shield, uh, Nintendo, uh, PC, uh, and Android, and uh, VR, and any kind of game. Uh, and the reason that it's highly popular in the gaming industry, I believe, is that they have so many things that they do as part of game development that require uh, a lot of resources that they are compute intensive. So it's not only uh, C++ compilation, but usually it's a uh, Rendering, uh, video rendering, image image processing. You have a lot of shaders, uh, which, for example, if you have uh, when you have a physics engine, you need to pre-calculate the shades of the objects in order for you not to do that uh, while the game is running. Uh, yeah, this is something. Uh, uh, yeah, not a lot of people mm-hmm. know, but basically, the game uh, developers they they try to sort of cheat as much as possible. Like. Yeah. If there's sort of really nice soft lighting, chances are that that's not being computed on the fly because that's extremely, extremely expensive. Um, there's this thing called Monte Carlo, uh, you know, photon mapping where literally each light just emits a bunch of rays of energy. And every time one of those rays of energy hits anything, it bounces and it becomes basically a new light source. And so it just blows up exponentially, right? And that's how you know, and you could imagine even in real life, if you open up a window just a tiny amount, you can light up a whole room. And that's because the, the photons are bouncing all over the place, right? And so to, to make that same effect in the game where it's not like everything is pitch black except for where the sun hits, um, they need to do this really, really expensive process. And so that always happens, uh, you know, before uh, uh, the game is even shipped. They just pre-compute that. Um, for everything that that isn't moving, and as you said, yeah, it's extremely expensive, but it's completely parallelizable. You could do every room independently. Yeah, and also, for example, if you take uh, the FIFA game, for example, you have different kind of stadium, different kind of lighting, and this lighting affect the way that uh, lights and shades are going to uh, interact, and also the the, the players themselves. For example, uh, Messi and Ibrahimovic have different sizes and different. Uh, you know, different way of interacting with the light. So uh, you can pre-compute that, and that's what they're doing. And it's uh, they have millions of pre-computation, and they can prepare that in advance, and that's what they're doing, and uh, they're doing it with incredible. Cool, that makes sense. So so what are the big differences between, you know, uh, for example, instead of Incredible, I could go and get some really powerhouse machine Maybe it has, you know, two processors. Maybe it has, you know, 36 cores or something like that. I don't know if that's even supported. Let's say, let's say 36 cores exist. No, you can say 80. And, oh, okay, okay. Oh, we like have customers 80 with 80 cores. cores, yeah. And so, so what's the real, you know, what's the difference between me doing that, spending maybe a lot of money up front and buying some 80 core machine versus using something like Incredibuild that, that's going to go back and forth over the network? So uh, I'll give you a, uh, uh, a live scenario. For example, let's assume you are a very large, I don't want to name names, but uh, let's assume you're a very large uh, company, an enterprise company, and you're working on a game or a different uh, project software, and you have uh, 100 uh, uh, engineers working on this software. 
So you'll need to purchase uh, 100 uh, multiplied by 80 core machine uh, in order for each engineer to have these 80 cores uh, to really run faster. Within Credibill, you can have each developer having uh, 8 core on his uh, machine, and each of them will be able to use all the idle CPU cycles with incredible seamlessly of all the other engineers working in his local network. So every engineer can essentially tap with incredible into 800 cores instead of just 80, uh, which will also cost you much less. An 80 core machine is very expensive. You won't be able to purchase one for each of your developers. And with and also 80 core, you think it's huge. But when you have a computation that takes 24 hours, that take two days, even 80 cores is not fast enough. And we, our users are using Credibill to distribute to hundreds of cores, and not only 80 cores. 80 cores is not, you know, it's not the high end of our users. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I mean, also, you know, <coughs> Bill goes on vacation to the Canary Islands or something. His machine is just, just sitting there wasted um, if, if you didn't have some type of distributed... Uh, with Incredibill, you have other stuff as well. So, for example, that we have customer companies that have multiple sites, geographical sites. So, uh, they can, one site when one in one site it's uh, daylight and it's working hours. The other site it's nighttime and their uh, resources are idle. So they can use uh, the resources from one site uh, to accelerate uh, the computation of the other site, which is quite cool. And another thing is uh, that you can always, with Incredible, and that's not something you can do when you purchase hardware, and this is something we see more and more, you can always scale to the public cloud. Essentially, all we need is a virtual machine. So especially in peak times, before game release, before Christmas, when you need to do more testing, you have uh, more compilation, and before releases, that's, exact, that's usually uh, when you need more resources and you don't have them, uh, with Incredibly, you can always scale. You can say, okay, I'll just add some uh, uh, 100 cores in any kind of public cloud uh, available and connect them to my uh, local network, and boom, you have more uh, resources to use. And, you know, time to market is very essential in these uh, uh, sectors. Yeah, that makes sense. So, but uh, I guess, you know, what if, uh, you know, what if you have a problem where there's sort of a lot of data um, you know, so is that sort of, you know, is that something that Incredibill can handle or, or, or how would you go about solving that problem? Like, for example, I mean, you, you brought up the example of the arenas, the football arenas. Um, I mean, maybe those files aren't that large and they can get passed around. It's really the computation. But what if it's something like, like, yeah, gigs of gigs of data. That's, that's, uh, and you, 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 that, that's right. That's a problem. Uh, so there are large meshes. There are uh, that's that's usually in specific uh, types of software. For example, in genetic algorithms, uh, when you're trying to calculate genetic uh, algorithm stuff, usually the data is very very large. Uh, if you can break the data uh, into multiple uh, subsets, uh, then it will work for you. It will be good because you can say, okay, when I'm running these types of algorithms. Uh, I need only uh, this a subset of the data, and then you can pass it away, uh, which is which is cool. But there are scenarios in which you have really really huge data, and not only that you have huge data, you need to load all this data to your memory, or else the computation time will will be uh, very very large. Uh, in these kind of very specific uh, cal- types of calculation. Usually, you, you, you won't be able to get around it. Nothing will help you, not an incredible, not a cluster, and you need a, a supercomputer uh, in order to uh, compute that uh, in, in an efficient manner. So, uh, there are specific problems that uh, you, you, you'll need an HPC machine, and that's why HPC machine exists. But if, if you can break the data, into multiple and smaller data sets along with the computation that go around that, then you can use Incredibit or you can use clusters or any kind of uh, distributed computing uh, technology. Um, so, so I guess, what's the difference then between, you know, I've seen there's, there's let's say, OpenMP or MPI or, or these kind of things, or I guess maybe OpenMP is a good example where you... Um, 
you know, or maybe LePack or something where there's parallelism kind of built into the code, the library. And then there's, on the other end of the extreme, there's like Hadoop and MapReduce and uh, Spark and these kind of distributed frameworks um, where sort of every machine is running some dedicated, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of server that can handle, you know, chunks of data and, and processes. And it sounds like Incredibuild kind of fits in between. You know, it's, it's sort of for people who don't want to have this huge farm of, of machines just sitting there to do computation and, and have to deal with MapReduce and all of that. Um, but it's also not all the way in the other end where you're having to write, like modify a lot of C++ code. This is kind of right in the middle. So I think that uh, the major difference... So Hadoop is usually for for data analysis and and less it's less used for act for for computation uh, but although it is but the main purpose of Hadoop is usually for for big data analytics and things like that uh, and b- f- with both in Hadoop and uh, OpenMP or other other uh, uh, infrastructure for parallel computing you need to write your software. Uh, in order to accommodate these technologies, these infrastructures. You need to uh, deeply integrate with these uh, technologies and you need to write your software in advance in order for it to be able to work with these kind of technologies. Uh, you need to consider a lot of stuff. Uh, you need to consider how you handle fault tolerance or if a node just go down, what's, what it is that you're doing in your software, how you handle scheduling, how you handle... Uh, in advance, how you handle the data uh, transfer and synchronization. Uh, with Incredibuild, the, the idea behind the product was to give you a solution that will simply work out of the box. So, for example, if you have something that you wrote, okay, uh, and if, if I'll provide you, so you wrote and you can run eight processes, eight, hundreds of processes in parallel, but you only have eight cores, uh, and uh, with Incredibuild, the idea was that you just plug Incredibuild, you install it on every agent you have in your local network, and, and Incredibuild will seamlessly use these idle resources of the other machines as though they are, reside in your own uh, laptop. You don't need to install anything on these remote machines besides Incredibuild. You know, don't need to transfer files. Uh, that's kind of magic. We're doing it with uh, a very unique technology, where, which should allows us to virtualize the process on the on the fly. But essentially, the idea was to give you a plug-and-play solution. So you don't need to write anything specific in your software in order to allow Incredibuild to do its trick and allow you to scale. Uh, so I think that's the major, uh, major difference between these kind of solutions. Uh, cool. So, so what is... Uh, how does that actually work? So in other words... If let's say I have some program that um, uh, let's say it, it plays a game um, and it outputs the result of that it plays a game between two AIs and it outputs the result of that game to a file um, and you want to do that let's say a hundred times or a thousand times so what you want in the end is to have you know a thousand files on your own machine with all of the replays. Um, and, and so if Incredibuild is farming all of that out, how does it go and collect all the files and how does it sort of manage all of that? So I think that uh, that's, that's the very unique technology uh, we developed in Incredibuild, uh, which uh, it's a process level virtualization technology, which allows us essentially to take any kind of process and distribute it to any kind of remote machine and emulate the environment that the process requires in order to successfully run on this remote machine and as, as though the process is running on your local uh, computer. Uh, the way that we're doing that for any kind of process, it's not only the output file because, for example, so uh, let's assume that, as you said, you have this uh, uh, game that you want to play uh, 100, 1,000 times. This game is a process that uh, gets some parameters. Uh, with Incredibuild, uh, automatically you run all these processes in parallel. Incredibuild, and then you, you'll simply have your command line. Let's assume that you have a parameter saying how many of these processes to run in parallel. Uh, uh, so you will have playgames.exe 100, which will say playgames.exe to execute 100 games.exe. Uh, Incredibuild will then take, so 
your main process will run all these 100 processes. Incredibly will then take hold of this queue of you trying to execute 100 processes and it will uh, interact with a coordinator component of Incredible telling you, listen, I need 100 cores, just give me whatever you have. Uh, and let's assume that the coordinator uh, looks around all the agents that are installed in your network and will uh, be able to provide you 100 cores and then uh, the Incredibit on your local machine <coughs> will uh, tell uh, a remote machine to run uh, an instance of uh, a, a game.exe. Now, on this remote machine, you don't have anything besides Incredibit. You don't have the game.exe process. You don't have the DLLs that maybe the libraries that, the, uh, that uh, this exe requires. You don't have input files. Nothing is there besides Incredibit. Uh, the way that we uh, allow this to happen is uh, by the on the remote machine you have an incredible agent and the incredible agent will run this uh, process on the remote machine and will essentially inject incredible code into the process level. So and this uh, code of incredible, this is injection technologies. This code of incredible will actually act as a middleman between the process running remotely and the remote operating system. So all the calls that interest us, that tries to reach the operating system from your process, will first be intercepted by Incredibit. So once you try to open a file on a specific location, this file does not exist on the remote machine because you don't have anything, uh, any, any DLL, any, any input file on the remote machine. But Incredibit will intercept the call, so if you try to open a file in my documents, uh, a.txt, uh, for example, Incredible will intercept the call. It will see that you don't have the file uh, in the Incredible cache. It's a kind of sandbox we manage on the remote machine. And it will then go to the Incredible agent on your local machine and ask for this file. And it will copy this file on demand to, the, to a special location, a special cache that we uh, have on the remote machine. And it will then redirect the, the API call, the OS API call. Instead of opening the file in My Documents in Windows, it will say open the file in C Program Files Incredible Cache uh, A.txt. And then it will only then the API call will be passed to the operating system. The operating system will then go to the location we provided instead of the original location. The file exists there because we copied it. And it will open a file and bring back a handle. Incredible will then take this handle and it will forward it to your process running on the remote machine. So from the OS perspective, if there was a file and it opened it, and from the process running remotely, the process perspective, it has a handle that it can work with. Uh, so this is what we're doing for any kind of file system related call or any kind of thing that we like to virtualize. So it can be opening and loading a DLL, writing a file, opening a file, creating a directory, uh, accessing the registry. Every kind of thing is virtualized on the fly by Incredibit. So essentially the remote process uh, thinks is actually, uh, it has on the fly we provide it with an emulation of everything that it needs as though it's being executed on the local machine. So once the file, uh, once this process tries to write the output, we do the same thing. We intercept the uh, create file and write uh, operation and we redirect them to our own uh, special location, and once the process finished running, we simply synchronize back the files that were created by this process to the original place where the process tried to write them on your local machine. So from your perspective as a user, it's really as though you have 100 cores running for you on your local device. And it's not only cores, it's also memory, it's also any kind of, uh, you know, uh, the network bandwidth, you can use more because you're actually using more computers, more memory, more cores, more CPU processing power, etc. That makes sense. That makes sense. So just to walk through the example here, so you would, um, let's say at 100 machines, you called play game with 100. Um, it would, it would, it would create 100 processes, let's say one on each machine. And then when it went to play the game, that game might require all sorts of rules and, and other files. And on demand, those get pulled from your machine and then uh, uh, distributed out, like fanned out to these 100 machines. They're going to go and play 100 games in the time it would take you to play one game on one thread locally. And then when the game finishes, they'll save the replay and the Incredible will, will detect, oh, 
you know, there's a new file here that was created by this remote process. I better send it back to the to the main computer so that it 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 knows it's there. Yeah, exactly. Simple, cool. right? That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think it's clever. Yeah, very clever. Uh, but it requires um, a lot of deep understanding into the operating system low level, you know, intercepting all these calls and uh, uh, implementing this. It's highly complex. And you're speaking about multi-tenant, uh, asynchronous, uh, a highly parallel execution. That makes it very complex. Fault tolerant, you know. If one machine goes down, we need to recover automatically. That These are things you... When you're using, uh, uh, when you're trying to do something like this yourself, you need to take care of that with incredibly it's taken care of for you. So this this is this is quite complex to develop. Dory, so yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so, go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, so doing this uh, process level virtualization, though, that does that imply that all of the machines are running a fairly similar version of the same operating system? Uh, so we 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 support different flavors. Of the same, so if you are running Windows, you can you can work with any kind of Windows version. You can uh, distribute uh, uh, Windows 7 to Windows Service 2016, okay. uh, but you cannot distribute Windows to Linux because okay. the yeah. way that the operating system work are different. But in Linux, for example, you can work with Ubuntu, CentOS, Fedora, etc. in the same grid. So we can distribute Ubuntu processes to Fedora or to CentOS or etc. So then for things like shared libraries and dynamically loaded things, those all still have to be passed over the network then. Yeah, but they only you only we only need to pass them once and then we cache them on the uh, remote machine. Okay. So the next time you run the same any process that will require the same libraries, they're already there on your helper machine, so we don't need to transfer them back. So you only get this latency usually on the first process you ever execute. Uh, on your uh, infrastructure, because in a regular scenario, uh, your 100 developers will more or less use the same kind of deal as the same infrastructure. Uh, so uh, your helpers, after a while, uh, their cache will be full of data, will, will be filled with data, and then the network latency will be very minimal. Uh, from our test, it's it's just a warm up of uh, a few milliseconds. And then how do you? Like, how do you sort of understand up front the weight of a process? So in Jason's example of playing 100 games, all 100 processes are doing roughly the same amount of work. Um, but yeah. what happens if, you know, you're spinning up 100 and the, you have, you know, a exponential distribution where you have a few processes doing, you know, orders of magnitude more work, but yet, you know, in, in your, your, you know, sort of networked set of computers, some are very powerful, some are not. Yeah. So uh, we have we have the, so we have a component which we call a coordinator. Uh, its role is to do assignment algorithms. Uh, so okay. this uh, all the agents, all the incredible agents, report to this coordinator, and the only job the coordinator needs to do is to coordinate between these agents. So the way that we solve this uh, question that you have is uh, uh, by providing each agent some kind of grade. Uh, we grade each agent, each computer. And then we will always try to use the, uh, you know, the, the strongest machines uh, at the beginning and not the weak machines. Uh, and we have we have some optimizations for that. Uh, and for example, let's let's give another example. For example, let's assume that uh, uh, I'm using your machine as a helper. Your machine was idle, so I, I used your machine. But then, and you as a developer, suddenly you do something on your machine. You copy a large amount of data or you just start running a game. We don't want it to disturb you. So once you started the game and you want to play it, and incredibly it is utilizing your idle resources, these resources are not idle anymore. So one of the mechanisms is to be able to detect this and to stop all the incredible processes running on your machine as a helper in order not to disturb you doing your own work and re-executing them on a different machine. So from the from my perspective as a user, I won't even know that my processes were terminated on your machine and were rescheduled to run on a different machine. So there are a lot of things we need to take into consideration in order to streamline the experience. What about uh, inter-process communication? Yeah. Um, how does that work? So that's a good question. Uh, with Incredible, there are a set of limitations that uh, in, you need to meet in order to be able to use our product. So uh, 
inter-process communication is one of them, but it really depends on the way you do inter-process communication. If you're using, for example, shared memory in order to communicate between processes, uh, I won't be able to distribute the process to your machine if it tries to use the shared memory to communicate with the process running on my machine. So this is something yeah, we do not support. But if you're using TCP IP, uh, which usually you won't do for inter-process communication, but if you do, that's supported. That's not a problem because it, will, it can work across the network. So it really depends on how you implement uh, process communication. Uh, another thing that we have a lot is a scenario in which you execute multi-process which do uh, uh, inter-process communication using shared memory, for example, but it's okay to run all of these kind of processes on a single machine. So you just need to tell us uh, in a way that these processes should run together on a single machine and we'll distribute all of them as a batch uh, to a specific machine. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I guess a, a lot of people, I, I would imagine almost everyone listening has built code. <clears throat> almost everyone listening has, uh, you know, opened up Visual Studio or, or, or run GCC or something like that, right? And for most, you know, when I was in college, most of my projects compiled pretty quickly, right? So, uh, you know, going to just the, the sort of origin of the company, right? Um, you know, why do builds take a long time? Why do they need to be parallelized? Uh, you know, I just, you know, like, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Why don't builds just finish in, you know, three seconds? Yeah, or something? <laughs> yeah I wish they would. Uh, I'm not sure that I, I would say that again because or else I won't have uh, a lot of things to do here. Although we are, as I said, we are doing today, I think that uh, the industry is going towards testing and not only building. If you're going, for example, just as a side note, uh, if yeah. we're speaking about the trend of continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevOps, uh, so you want to streamline the, the, the ability to take your product uh, to deployment every time and have short iterations. I, we see a, I see a trend of companies investing a lot of effort in, in testing, even more than in uh, other areas, because if you want to deploy automatically, you need to have a very, very large coverage. So, yeah, that makes uh, sense. And now, so, nowadays yeah. with the Internet... Um, yeah, they're constantly pushing out new patches, and so they want to make a new release every week or every month or something like that. And, and they need to every single release needs to be good. Yeah, and not only that, we see a trend, and that's very popular. And I think the industry is moving towards this direction. Uh, that uh, and that's the you know the holy grail. But uh, we we already see companies doing this holy grail. So every commit that a developer pushes can be automatically deployed into production automatically. And that's that's amazing because that really gives you the competitive edge. A big, as, as, as a CTO, as, as someone who managed software delivery, I can tell you that uh, uh, a lot of times the developer says, yeah, well, to have, we finished it one month ago, but unless it's on the users running, you didn't do anything. If it's yeah. only on your environment, you actually didn't deploy anything. Uh, so uh, the trend is towards continuous deployment, uh, which uh, means that once I'll do something, I'll fix a bug as a developer, I'll push commits, and then I'll have an, a completely automatic flow that will take my commit into production without me doing any manual thing uh, in the middle. Uh, and it will be able to also automatically uh, roll back. But in order to achieve that, you need to have a lot of testing because you need to make sure things uh, work correctly in order to be automatic, uh, mm -hmm. full full automatic. And that's where I see more and more uh, users using Credible to actually accelerate their testing. Uh, so that was a side note. But uh, uh, for compilations, you're right. If you are doing a very sh small software, it usually takes a few seconds. It actually also depends uh, on the language you're using. So... Uh, uh, languages that compile to machine uh, code, such as C and C++, uh, will take longer to compile than languages which compile to intermediate languages, such as uh, C Sharp and Java. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially, you but you have we we are working with users that have very very large code base. Uh, I don't want to mention names, but. Uh, a sure. very large software running on your uh, Windows uh, uh, OS, they can have 
the largest that I'm, I'm familiar with that working with Incredibility that has 20 gigs of source code. And I'm speaking only Whoa. source code. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. That's, that's unbelievable. Very, yeah, that's one of the, it's, it's, it's very known product. It's used by a, a lot of, a lot of users worldwide. And that's 20 gigs of source code. Uh, 20 gigs? I mean, I'm trying to wrap my head around just that. Sources. So each line is 80 bytes, right? And so, uh, uh, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, and it takes something like uh, to compile this software. It takes uh, its commercial software. It takes 20 hours to compile it. And yeah, you can maybe, maybe reduce it to less than an hour if you compile it. Maybe I'm the getting this software. wrong, and maybe I'm getting this wrong, and I'm going to get a ton of hate mail. But but I just did 20 billion divided by 80. So assuming every line is completely full of, of code, you know, which is not, that's a very conservative estimate. You're still looking at 250 million lines of code. Yeah, that's, that's, but you that's have a lot of software having. Yeah, but a lot of it could be auto generated. Yeah, 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 yeah so, that's true. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's one of the, you're asking how do we reach this kind of, you know, large code. So, uh, Auto-generated code using templates, uh, working with third-party libraries that uh, you don't know exactly what's going on there. So this this really makes your code very large. Uh, you yeah, that's true. I saw reach. I saw a game recently where they actually had it was um it was Eve Online actually has uh, Chrome the entire Chrome framework in the game so that they can do browsers. So. So, for example, the help in the game is actually a web browser that renders in the game. And yeah. to make that happen, they 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 have all of Chrome. <laughs> so yeah. I, I'm pretty sure Chrome is, is a ton of code. So yeah, actually, that's just actually one it's part, part of, of our game. regression. Uh, Chrome, the Chrome project is part of our regression tests. Mm -hmm. uh, so incredibly, so when, when we want to make sure that uh, we, we, we uh, ship uh, product correctly and we have our own tests, uh, the way that we test our product and see that we didn't introduce new bugs into it is to run a lot of these kind of projects. We compile Chrome, we compile Qt, and we compile a lot of uh, large open sources and, and physics engines, etc., uh, in order to see that uh, everything works well. And Chrome really is, a, is, is quite large. It takes a long time to do that, but it, it's highly parallel. So if you have a lot of resources, you can run it, you can compile it quite fast, uh, as opposed to if you only have eight or 16 cores in your, in your machine. So yes, that's, that's how you increase, uh, your source code. And in, in today's trend, you have a lot of open sources, you have a lot of, uh, open software, etc. So it's, uh, we see a lot of, uh, developers just, uh, if it's not well ar uh, architectured, and we see a lot of software having a specific problem and they just find some kind of open source in the net and say, okay, I'll use that to solve my problem. And bam, you have, you know, I don't know, uh, 200,000 lines of code you need to compile. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that grows and grows, yeah. Yeah, and there's, I, I think, yeah, and, and also the, the auto generation, you probably have um, a lot of things that they want baked into the code. Um, you even like, an icon image and things like that, they'll actually have uh, uh, some software that converts that into a C file so that it can't be tampered and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that makes the code base huge. Uh, another thing that I see a lot, and that's something when we see uh, code samples from users, we, we, you know, sometimes we see that uh, people are placing huge amounts of stuff in their include files. So we, they, they include more and more stuff as part of their headers, uh, which require you to uh, do a lot of compilations uh, in order to get that running. Uh, so there are a lot of good practices how to write a good code that will actually not, uh, you know, overload your compilation time. Uh, and uh, you, it's, a, it's a good practice to adhere and understand that there are some good practices to, to develop this kind of efficient uh, software. Can we rant against Boost now? <laughs> against Boost. <laughs> if we're yeah, talking about keeping build thing. times low? Yeah. yeah, you know, we, um, uh, so I worked on this project, uh, this, this project at work, but it was kind of a side project, um, called Eternal Terminal, um, which, uh, is just kind of a replacement for SSH, um, that we're using at, at the place I work. And, uh, um, one of the things, so 
I ended up kind of not being able to dedicate as much time to it as, as it really needs. So uh, the company actually hired somebody who's full-time working on it now, and uh, that person removed Boost. The only thing I was using Boost for was um, the circular buffer and a couple of other kind of minor things. And yeah, the, the compilation time sped up enormously. It's just because it's all, I guess, header header libraries that are getting yeah, I'm being slightly analyzed. Fair. So I, I mean, I, that wasn't <laughs> that's just a, that's the joke about Boost is that it always makes build times bad, and it's not an unfounded joke, but yeah, there are good reasons yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah, we have that's that's a common problem that we see with users with our users. A lot of our users, a lot of our users are using Boost, and that's good for us, you know, because they <laughs> we, we help them you know fight faster. <laughs> Uh, and uh, another thing you need to take into consideration is the, is, is the fact that uh, sometimes you take another open source. For example, you just want to solve some, I don't know, you want to have some math uh, calculations or a specific problem that you, that you see a nice library, a nice open source that solves that. And in the background, this open source uses Boost, and you don't even know that. Yep. So that's something we see a lot. If you are using people that develop open source tend to rely on other open sources as well in order to get it into the market faster and in a more stable manner. That's cool. But uh, then you tr just add one open source and in the background it adds 10 more open sources to your code without you knowing that. And that's how software gets bigger. And that's one of the things that we see more and more. And I expect to see even more in the future because open source is really where the market is going. You can see a lot of companies, commercial companies, opening up their code to be open source. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and yeah, that's, that's where the industry is moving. So I think that we'll see more of that. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's in some sort of like game... From a game theoretic standpoint, it's in some kind of well right now where if a company isn't going to open source their technology, that actually creates a liability for the people who are working at that company. Or like Microsoft was like this for a long time. They were suing the Mono people. Um, they were actually, uh, they made their closed source version of Java, the J++, and I think Oracle sued, I don't know. But, but they were trying to keep everything locked down and... Um, you know, what they found is that it was just very hard to get talent and, and even to get people to use the software because it creates this liability. And now you really see Microsoft, you know, kind of being one of the last people to the party there, but, but open sourcing a lot more of their technology and, and now embracing mono and things like that. So I, I can tell you that, uh, from recent, uh, thing, surveys that I saw, etc., that Microsoft is one of the, today is one of the largest contributors to open source, which is, uh, which is, yeah. Uh, yeah. And they open source NSB, they open source, I think, also .NET, and they open sourced many of the tools that once were very close. And it, uh, it, it's very good for them. It's doing very good for the industry, for them as well, and uh, for the adoption. Uh, and so this is, and, and people now need, are able to add and, uh, you know, work with this more efficiently. And that's where everything is going. So I think that we'll see, as I said, more and more of that. Yeah, I actually tried the uh, Visual Studio Code, which is a brand yeah. new browser. They forked uh, Atom, which is a GitHub browser uh, created by the, the GitHub company. And uh, Visual Studio Code is pretty amazing. Uh, it's totally open source. And uh, I was really, really impressed. It has tons of users. Uh, it's really good. It works really fast. They are very, they're really investing in, in making it light and fast and cross-platform, of course. And it supports, the last time I saw it was something like more than 100 languages. Um, yeah. It's really cool. It's a cool product. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. And um, we're going so... to see Incredible there as well, I believe, next year. Oh, cool. So it's not only Visual Studio. We are now we for we 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 have it more and more commercial tools. Uh, also IDEs, so you can work with it in uh, Qt Creator uh, in Visual Studio, as I said. Uh, and uh, you're going to see it soon in Eclipse and uh, in uh, Cilium and others as well. So when you try to, um, I guess in the sense that you you're mentioning, oh, you're going to see it here, you're going to see it there. So so there's still something that the end user like kind of walk us through what the end user has to do. let's say i let's say i make uh i made some um some evolutionary computation system uh and it's some binary i wrote it creates a bunch of processes and uh, each of them does some simulation and then i collect the results and 
and uh, do some analysis, right? Mm -hmm. What? So I have this EXE, you know, it, it does all of this on my machine, and I want to use Incredibuild. What, you know, what do I have to do? Like, uh, uh, you know, in other words, like, uh, what is involved in getting it to support a uh, new application? Yeah, so the, the, let's assume that your main process is uh, main, and your uh, sub-processes are sub, okay? And main process execute 100 sub-processes. So the way to integrate Incredibuild into that is to say, to open an XML file and to say uh, main.exe uh, space uh, allow intercept equals true. That tells Incredibuild that this is the parent process that executes uh, sub-processes. And then you have a new line and you say sub.exe uh, space allow remote equals true, which tells Incredibuild every time that this main process will execute the sub-process, I want this sub process to be executed remotely by Incredibuild. And then if you, and, and that's it. That's the only configuration file you need to edit. And then let's assume that your main command was main.exe space, uh, and 100, which tells your main.exe to run 100 sub, uh, processes. The only thing you need to do is say, uh, IB console, which is the Incredibuild command line interface, slash command, and pass your original command to Incredibuild. And that's it. That's all the integration you needed to do. And your 100 sub-processes will be automatically distributed by Incredibuild, and all your outputs will be automatically synced back to your local machine. And from your perspective, it's really as though you have 100 cores on your local laptop. That's it. I, it will I take see. You so, two minutes. So when you say, uh, you know, Incredibuild is coming to Visual Studio Code, for example, so what that would be is like a, a mm -hmm. module... That would come with an XML file that's designed for Visual Studio Code, and uh, um, um, and uh, uh, yeah, I guess that just that XML. Oh, and also it would have to call the Incredibuild uh, function yeah. when it's launching the binary. Yeah. So so it would do those two things, but you would provide that as like a package for Visual yeah. Studio Code. So Actually, users are already using Credibuild both in Visual Studio Code with C, with Eclipse, with uh, uh, Cilion, etc. Because they are all they all have essentially a command line uh, uh, behind them. So and you can use today. You can actually execute any command line that you have uh, with Credibuild. So if you're using Cilion, for example, once you compile your code with Cilion, it generates a CMake, uh, which is a build system, a CMake command line. You can simply take this CMA command line and run it also today. Customers are doing that. They're just running their CMA command line with Incredibuild and they accelerate their C line uh, uh, executions. Uh, when I'm saying that we integrate into that, it means that we need to have uh, a plugin and extensions that you see as part of the IDE itself. Uh, it doesn't mean that people are not working with it today. But it's not into the, it's, it's just a matter of doing a, usually a plugin of Incredibuild that will wrap everything out and will interact with the IDE itself. Uh, we also have a very, very, uh, cool, uh, visualization, uh, which is, which is very, very great because it allows you to have all these, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of textual output, uh, drawn to you uh, by Incredibuild as a graphical representation. So you can see very easily what's running, where it's running. Uh, we, if, if it fails, you'll see a red bar. If it succeeds, you'll see a green bar. You can see how many computation power we're using, how many file I, your, your processes are doing, etc. And once you execute anything with Incredibuild, you'll have that out of the box. So it's either for compilation or testing or anything else, You'll do with Incredibly, you'll get this very cool graphical representation of the executions that you're making. So in the freemium version that Incredibly has inside the chip with, chips with Visual Studio 2017, uh, you can just run your compilations and you'll see your compilation in a graphical manner. Uh, and you'll be able to quickly analyze gaps and overloaded areas and where you are under provisioning your cores, etc. So when we do that, usually we want to put all this graphic visualization in Visual Studio is part of Visual Studio. You see it as a Windows embedded inside Visual Studio. And when we integrate with another ID, we want to keep the same kind of experience. We want you to have a plugin, an extension 
that you can just uh, build with IncrediBuild and then the IncrediBuild visualization won't open as a separate window, but inside the ID. So this is kind of this kind oh, of makes technicalities. Sense. Yeah. So so uh, you mentioned freemium. So if I'm you know college student, you know living on ramen noodles, and uh, I just want to install this on you know my whole dorm so that all of us can can build our code faster. Uh, you know what what is the what is free and then what features you know uh, uh, cost uh, require the professional build? Yeah, so uh, the free version gives you the ability to use incredibly distributed manner only for five agents up to sixteen core each, but only for a month. Although we have special uh, discounts for students, but uh, yeah, I know for a student that I was a student in the past as well, so I know how it works. Uh, but the actual free for life part of the premium version is the ability for you to run it on your local machine. And then you can ask, but, well, well, but incredible main technology is the distribution technology. How would it help me if I can only run it on my local machine? So first, the visualization part that I said uh, is, is uh, you'll, you'll be able to use it for free for life uh, in the premium edition. Uh, and it's really cool and it really helps and it really helps to see what's going on and it really helps to analyze your builds and uh, see errors more clearly. And unless you saw, it's, it's, a, it's a podcast, so I can't show anything, but, uh, <laughs> uh, such, yeah, but it's really cool. You can go into our website and see some uh, galleries. Uh, and another thing that we have specifically for, so, and we have a very rich command line interface. So, for example, you can say stop on first error instead of just uh, letting your compilation continue, which is the default way of uh, uh, Visual Studio to run. And another thing we did uh, in Visual, in, in Incredible, and it's free as part of the freemium edition for Visual Studio, for example, is we have, and that's something I didn't delve into uh, because there are so many things that we are doing. I can't go into all the details. We just spoke about the main concept of the technology. But for Visual Studio, for example, we have uh, predictive execution. Uh, so uh, it allows us to actually utilize your own local cores uh, much better than the default way it's uh, being used usually. Uh, so if you have some, yeah, so we know what's the real dependencies uh, in your solution, and we know how to actually run uh, it better. If you, even if you, if you, for example, if you uh, uh, define some dependencies that are not needed, we'll be able to detect it. Sometimes when, for example, if you have a project uh, Two and project two depends on project one. Uh, then usually the way that you'll see that is you see the compilations of project one running and then the link of project one and then the compilations of project two and then the link of project two. But essentially most of the times, not always, but most of the time, the compilation, only the link part of project two depends on the link part of project one and not the compilations. Right. So with Incredible, our predictive execution will, will know that. And we'll be able to run in parallel the compilations of project one and project two, and then the link of project one and the link of project two. So we can actually increase your performance, your build time performance, even on your local infrastructure, not only uh, when you're doing a distributed builds. Very cool. So this is kind of a random question, but uh, I seem to remember on a GCC mailing list a few years back, someone talking about like a multi-process link or a distributed linker. Um, does that, does that exist or is that just kind of a, you know, a fantasy? Like it is, is cause I remember the linking part, you know, for example, if all your libraries are, let's say static libraries that you're building, then the linking part is really what's going to kill you in terms of performance. Um, can you use Incredible to speed up the link or, or is the link in Visual Studio still only on one process? It's not only Visual Studio. It's, I, I didn't. I didn't hear uh, something that can break your linking into multiple processes. Uh, yeah, so, I, I remember seeing uh, someone just basically positing it. But yeah, I don't. I guess it, it never actually existed. <laughs> so yeah, I, I know that, that that's something always coming from the industry because links are bottleneck because they can only run uh, sequentially on a single core. And unless you have multiple links or with Incredible, for example, once we link a specific project, we can in parallel compile other projects that will need to be compiled later on. So this is something that allows us to, uh, the, the link will not be a bottleneck, but still the link is a major bottleneck, uh, everywhere. 
And the way that uh, uh, that Microsoft, for example, Visual Studio and others are uh, are addressing it is to try and minimize the uh, latency, the perform to to maximize the performance and optimize the link uh, process itself. So, for example, in Visual Studio recently, Microsoft introduced by default uh, a, a, a flag which uh, is called FastLink, which uh, optimizes the link time. But that's the way they, they address this problem currently. I didn't hear of anything that can break the link time into multiple processes. But we, we really want it to happen because then Incredible will be able to distribute these uh, uh, multi-linking processes into additional machines and will actually even more increase the link time. So once this will be available, I will be the first to adopt it. So, yeah, I actually I looked it up and uh, it exists. It's called Gold. So it's, ah, I think gold. it's only, it's only yeah. for, for Linux, maybe, uh, or maybe not. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, if you use the gold linker, then it's, uh, then it, uh, it runs in multiple cores. So yeah, potentially, uh, maybe this gold will work with Incredibuild, although it might, it might have so many dependencies that it might not be worth it in terms of, you know, the, the file transfer might end up being the bottleneck thing. I heard that there are the file transfer can be a bottleneck, but uh, not that much with today's networks. I know that there are users working with Gold with Incredibuild in the Linux edition of Incredibuild, uh, but I, I never considered that as uh, you know. I never looked into that, so that's something that I will do. Thanks. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah, pretty. Pretty cool. Yeah. I know there's. Uh, I've seen. I've seen companies where um, they they build everything as a static library. And then they do this enormous link. And uh, so, yeah, it must be, it's probably some combination of that and some other technology. So so what about um, the Incredibuild as, as sort of a company? Um, so you said that you've been, the company's been around for uh, more than a decade. Um, so kind of where is it located? Are you hiring? What kind of positions are you hiring for? Um, do you do internships for, for people listening who are college students? Um, that, that sort of stuff, like company related stuff. Okay, so just one note before that uh, about Gold Link and, uh, and oh, sure. general. Yeah, so uh, one of the things, and it's, it's really cool with Incredible because it's a generic infrastructure. Uh, we actually don't even know a lot of times what our users are doing with our product. So I can just, <laughs> that's true. yeah, yeah, and that's really cool because uh, I'm speaking with uh, with the bank, for example, that can come and say, listen, we are doing this huge amount of uh, financial derivatives, or I can have a customer telling me that he uh, actually, uh, it, it was a, f- a few years ago, for example, I had a very, very, very large, one of the largest game studios telling me, listen, we w- we are accelerating Maya which is a commercial product with Incredibuild. And I said, wow, that's cool. I didn't know that Incredibuild is accelerating my computations. And that's that's something related also to the gold linker. I'm, I'm sure that we have users, that they're using any kind of compiler, any kind of tool, because we are agnostic to the processes that you're running with us. Uh, so we, we don't need to actually do a specific integration with, with any kind of process. And that's why we sometimes don't even know uh, for the, all the uses that Incredibly is used for. Uh, I'll just give another example. Uh, I visited another very large uh, company in Japan. They told me that they are doing a stress test in Incredibly. Uh, and I said, well, how do you do that? So stress test is where you want to stress the server. Uh, so in, in order to stress the server in the past, they needed to provision a lot of virtual machines on the fly, copy the processes there, and make sure that they are running against the server exactly at the same time in order to stress the server with, with requests and, uh, and processing things, etc. But they said, with Incredibit, we only have now a script file, and then every developer can run this script file, these processes will be automatically distributed to a lot of machines, and they will connect to the server. So this, these are use cases that I actually learned from, from customers and not coming from, from us. Which is which is very nice cool. and very cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it's, amazing. It's remarkable. Yeah. So uh, regarding your question, uh, we are hiring everywhere. We are hiring uh, software developers. Uh, uh, if if you are uh, doing internal, uh, if you are internal C plus plus developer, you are into operating system internals, etc. Uh, we are looking into this kind of uh, software developers, uh, both Linux, Windows. 
Uh, we are looking for professional services guys, uh, um, uh, QA interns. Uh, it depends on what it is that you know how to do. Uh, usually, our, when we are working with interns, it's around uh, uh, deploying CrediBuild and testing CrediBuild with a variety of open source tools and doing some white papers and uh, benchmarks and uh, trying to integrate CrediBuild with, with open sources because there are so many uh, tools and software out there that are doing multi-process execution and we'd like to notify the market, listen, we can do that as well. We can do uh, this kind of compression, this kind of coding and this kind of obfuscation, etc. And that's usually uh, uh, the things that we're doing with, with interns that are working with us. Uh, we are we are located in Tel Aviv, uh, but we are working with uh, with people abroad as well. We have an office in Japan. We are working with the U.S. Uh, so it's not uh, it's if you're if you're located elsewhere and you want to work with us and you want to intern with us, just let us know. Cool, cool, good to know. Um, so what is tell us the coolest thing about uh, working at Incredible, like either the office, something kind of really unique, like. Uh, could be the location. It could be, uh, yeah, something. I think I, I actually maybe I'm a geek, but I actually like the the our customers because I'm working with the largest customers doing the coolest products in the world today. It can be the largest software, the commercial software. It can be the most popular games. Uh, and I think that one of the most interesting things is the ecosystem Incredibly is, is working inside. So it's gaming and continuous integration, and public cloud and DevOps and Visual Studio and other IDEs and financial derivatives. And uh, there are so many things I need to learn all the time because Incredibly is used in so, such a large variety of, to solve such a large variety of problems that I will never be able to cope with the entire ecosystem we are working in. And this environment of continuous learning and, you know, speaking with the customers and users and always learning new, new stuff, physics engines, uh, you know, other infrastructure, new technologies. This is something we always need to keep up with the pace because we are used inside this enormous industry to do practically anything inside this industry. So that's, I think, one of the coolest things. I, I, I never stop learning here. And this is something I really love to do. Cool. Very cool. Makes sense. You should have a regression test that uh, mines a Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, you already have solutions for that. But yeah, you could finance the, you could finance, uh, you know, the new, the new, uh, the new office with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we needed to start with that, uh, I think a few years ago and then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Cool. Um, well, thanks so much for, for being on the show. This is super awesome. And so there's there's a free version and there's also a student discount. So if you're a student, um, definitely check it out. Um, I think it would be, you know, the, the ease of use is, I think, by far the most compelling, the compelling part. I mean, you could, you know, in your dorm or in your in your lab, uh, you could install this on a bunch of machines and, and just kind of see what happens. Like any software you're developing right now, you could just... Uh, uh, I mean, assuming it's multi-process, you could just uh, run it in this environment and just, you know, it's kind of uh, um, kind of wild just to see what, what would happen. Maybe it would save you from having to uh, either wait a lot or, or or parallelize it all by hand. So yeah, and if you're running a cool project and you want to try and accelerate it uh, with Incredibuild in your in your university or etc., uh, just uh, drop us a note and we will help. Oh yeah, actually, with that in mind, give us some ways to reach out. So, so what's is the website uh, incredible uh, dot com or, or yeah, what's your incredible website? dot com? Incredible cool. dot com. And if you have something specific you'd like to ask or contact us, I think that the best way, if you're a tech, it's a technical question. Just uh, you can just email support at incredible dot com, and we'll get back to you. Cool. Very cool. Are you on uh, Twitter or Facebook or any of that? Everywhere, but all right. That's Everywhere. Not something I okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll we'll uh, we'll get the 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 Twitter handle and and Facebook and all of that, and we'll post it with the show notes. Great. Okay. Cool. Um, thank you so much, Dory, for your time. And, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, uh, yeah, check out the show notes. We'll we'll put a way for you to get in touch with Dory, and you can uh, uh, shoot them an email. Support that incredible dot com. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. It was great fun.
The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.